Thank you so much, Sarah. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see a really good turnout. I want to talk to you all a little bit about climate and public finance. Uh, maybe I could have come up with a more uh, descriptive title, but here we are. Um, so I do a lot of work on, climate, on public finance. When we think about public finance, this is the way in which governments raise money, often through debt markets, through, through taxation, and how that impacts consumers, businesses, workers, um, and the overall economy. A lot of my thought has been about tax breaks. So how do firms respond to tax breaks in terms of how do they change their input mix? How do they change the scale of their business? How do they change where they do business in response to tax breaks? So one of the ways in which the US has been interacting with um, the green transition, what we think of as moving away from carbon emitting and greenhouse gas emitting technologies to other technologies is through the energy sector. So we see uh, in the energy sector, um, the breakdown, well, the, excuse me, the breakdown of greenhouse gas emissions is shown here in the left-hand chart. So we can see really big industries that drive greenhouse gas emissions are transportation, electric power, and, and manufacturing industry in general in the US. So I'm gonna focus in on electric power. In electric power, the US tax code has been changed a lot in the last 20 years in a way that is intended to inspire investment and production of green energy, particularly through wind, geothermal, and solar sources. And so this happens through the Internal Revenue Code sections 45, which are production tax credits for wind and geothermal energy. That is, every time you, you generate energy with wind or geothermal sources, you get to claim a tax credit against your taxable income based on the amount of energy that you've produced. There's also the, IR, the Internal Revenue Code Section 48 Investment Tax Credit, which is really for solar production at the utility scale, which is when you build a solar farm, you're gonna get a tax credit for how much money you spent in capital expenditures while building that, uh, and that's gonna also be a, a write-off against your taxable income. So these are both tax credits, and a lot of how we try to inspire investment in green energy in the US is through tax credits. Tax credits are only gonna matter insofar as you either have taxable income or the tax credits are what we call refundable. That is, you can claim them even if you have negative taxable income. But most firms, and, and these two tax credits in particular, are not refundable. So you need to have a firm that has taxable income in order to take advantage of these credits. But it turns out a lot of firms don't actually have taxable income at any point in time. So what they turn to is what we call tax equity financing. So they're going to create what I've, I've you have a, a, a picture here in the upper right hand corner. They're going to create a special purpose vehicle, which we call a project special purpose vehicle. It's usually in the form in the US of a partnership where uh, a sponsor is going to actually run the project, but they're going to bring in a deep pocketed tax equity investor who has a lot of taxable income. This is usually, you can think a bulge bracket bank or maybe a very, very large utility company. Uh, and they're going to split such that the tax equity investor gets the tax credits for the first few years, and particularly those, those very front-loaded tax credits that require a whole lot of taxable income to claim. And the sponsor is going to claim the, the kind of long run, usually after the first five years, there's some vesting period. And so a lot of what I've been asking is, does this matter, and is this an efficient way of getting these tax credits out to firms that want to in invest in green energy projects? So, the big concern here is we would like to get extensive margin entry into, we want more people to build solar farms, we want more people to build windmills. Does this tax equity financing, is this an efficient way of getting that financing to people? So this actually has changed a little bit with the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Um, but right now what we can look at is through the history. So from 2007 up through 2020, we can say, what is the difference between the sorts of plants that were financed by tax equity financing and those that weren't? And so with the puzzle we're looking at in the data right now is it looks like even after controlling for everything under the sun and engaging in uh, Heckman-style selection models, it looks like these sorts of uh, plants are just producing a little bit more energy per unit capacity than other plants that aren't financed with tax equity financing. So the big questions here are why. Um, and we want to get into a, a lot more of um, how, how are operations changing or how is the, the maintenance or the, the process that kind of makes these plants look a little bit more efficient, conditional on a bunch of stuff? This is raw, but we can do it conditional. Um, why is that uh, happening in the way it is? And is this actually efficient or not? Um, I'll also note that uh, I love local public debt markets. Um, this is true around the world. We see local public debt markets are a place where green investment is happening. So that we can think states, cities, provinces around the world are engaging uh, in green investment by issuing uh, bonds to finance uses that are related to adoption to climate change. Um, in the US, I showed a similar graph somewhat last year. Uh, the US has a $4 trillion market for municipal bonds. Um, and we can see 
uh, only about 12, or 11% of it right now is lim labeled as green, social, or sustainable. And if we look at where this investment is happening in the US, it's happening in places we might expect. So it's happening a lot in California and New York. And so it's really, really concentrated in rich coastal cities and not necessarily a broad-based investment of climate investment where we might expect. This is 2013 to 2017. Uh, the picture gets a little better if we look 2018 to 2022, but not that much better. We see, still see social bond investment is really primarily happening in California. And we see states like Florida are only investing less than 10% per capita of, say, what even Indiana is investing through these sorts of um, through these sorts of uh, uh, instruments. So a lot of what I'm trying to look at is how does the financial process by which these bonds are brought to market limit the places that are able to inv uh, invest in these sorts of climate sensitive projects? Um, and so hopefully we'll have a lot more next year. Perfect, thanks so much. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Susanna Burkauer. Today I wanna to talk about climate and inequality. How are billions of people across the world with low incomes affected by climate? There's a few different impacts of climate. One thing that I'm interested in is tropical cyclones. These are called typhoons in the Pacific, uh, hurricanes in the Atlantic. They destroy livelihoods, they affect uh, human well-being. they cause uh, huge uh, mortality impacts. In addition to that, they also change investment appetite. And that can be at a large scale or at a small scale, right? If you're worried that a tropical cyclone is gonna affect your business, that it's gonna destroy your investments, you might be less likely uh, to make those investments and therefore you might continue earning lower incomes. Even if there isn't actually a storm, just the threat of these storms intensifying might lower the amount of investments that you do. Um, in addition, one thing that might encourage investment is by improving access to insurance markets, right? That can improve um, your appetite for investment because now you no longer face that risk that arises from these potential storms. There's huge global financial markets for climate insurance by things like Munich Re and Swiss Re. But these are operating at really large global levels. And it's not clear how we can relate to those large global markets for insurance with individual farmers in low-income countries who might be affected, who might not even have a bank account uh, in some cases. How can we connect these global insurance markets with small-scale small, sco small scale farmers? Uh, for example, in the Philippines, where we're looking here. Uh, this is an example of one of the worst uh, cyclones that they experienced in the past few years. There's two distinct ways in which you could potentially provide insurance. Most of you are perhaps more aware of indemnity insurance. If you've ever had a car accident or something happened to your house, you might be familiar with this. Uh, something happens. Somebody has to, you have to kind of assess your own damages. You submit some type of claim. A lot of paperwork is involved. Uh, the insurer, the insurance company has to review your claim, assess your actual damages. Oftentimes they have to actually inspect them visually. Somebody has to come to your house, right? This is really onerous, requires a lot of labor, requires a lot of time. Um, oftentimes you get less money than you think you should get, right, that you deserve. So you might be disappointed or frustrated with that. Um, and also this whole process costs a lot of money. And so if you have low-income households who maybe only want a smaller amount of money, it's not going to be cost-effective to provide this type of insurance. And so instead, there's a different type of insurance called parametric insurance, which should show up on the slide. There it is. Parametric insurance is automated, it's fair, and it's fast. So Global companies can use satellite information, such as what's displayed here. This is showing uh, temperatures in real time. These are kind of hourly level data, really, really geographically specific data. You can monitor this in London or New York or wherever you might be located, and you can identify storms as they happen. And you can have an insurance contract that basically says if temperature exceeds a certain threshold or if rainfall exceeds a certain threshold or if drought exceeds or whatever type of parameter you want to insure, you can insure that and within days that global insurance company can make that transfer automatically. There's no inspection of damages, there's no other process. The, the event is detected with satellite data and the transfer is effectively uh, initiated almost immediately. Um, you can imagine how this can improve access, right? You can get these payments to local farmers within days, potentially. Uh, in the Philippines, this has been happening for the past few years. This is an example of one of the cooperatives getting a payout. 
So a cooperative in the Philippines is a small bank. There's tens of thousands of cooperatives all across the Philippines. Each small village basically has a cooperative. And because they are in the banking system, they can get these types of insurance policies and then distribute the payouts to the farmers that are affected. This is an example of one of the provinces. So the premiums are calibrated to the risk levels that each province faces. Um, you can have higher or lower triggers, right? You can set the rainfalls and the wind speeds that might trigger different amounts of payouts. This is all super customizable. They have different types of policies in different countries. Um, the the London-based insurance company, they have, uh, they're called Global Parametrics. They have these types of policies for earthquakes, for all sorts of natural disasters that you can detect remotely all across the world. Um, we're working with Ibiza, which is a platform that basically uses these, uh, the satellite data uh, and detects these events in real time. And they then pass the transfers on uh, to Climes, which is a bank in the Philippines. And it's the bank in the Philippines, Climes, that then can distribute all of the payments to the cooperatives. Again, uh, in these cases, this can happen within days after a storm like this. So I'm telling you all these uh, kind of issues, right? How can we get this money uh, to farmers and to local villages uh, in a short time? This is all nice in theory, right? This sounds really good. Uh, but let's actually see whether it works. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer to you today. What I am going to tell you is that over the next year, we're going to, over the next two years, we're going to be surveying lots of farmers. So actually, over the past uh, couple of months, we've surveyed 100 cooperatives and 1,000 farmers to understand uh, what types of insurance they have, what they might do with these types of outcomes. And then over the next couple of years, we're going to track payouts, insurance policies, storms as they happen to see how uh, these larger numbers of co-ops and farmers are going to be affected. So we want to know whether this type of insurance can spur business investment by reducing the risk associated with investments. Um, we want to know whether it can alleviate humanitarian crises by offering people these payments and uh, perhaps they can get food or they can get access to housing more quickly if, if that was destroyed. Uh, and then finally, we want to know whether it's better to offer insurance to individuals or to these cooperative banks. So we want to compare those and see which of these provides uh, better incentives for investment in the long run. I'll end there. Thanks so much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to meet you all. I'm one of the newbies here. Uh, so my research focuses on energy markets, specifically electricity markets and transportation markets, as well as energy justice and equity. And one of the topics that I focus on that is at the intersection of all of these things is what's referred to as energy insecurity, or sometimes energy poverty. And this is when a household might struggle to pay their energy bills, or they might face deficient energy conditions, such as not being able to turn their heat up high enough for their air conditioning at the right temperature. Now, I've measured energy insecurity through a variety of surveys and other formats over the past several years. Years, and I'm featuring some of the results here, as well as some ongoing projects. Uh, the way that I've displayed energy insecurity on the right-hand side is the way that I've measured it in survey work. First, whether a household struggles to pay their energy bill. Second, whether they receive a notice for disconnection. And third, whether the household is disconnected due to non payment of their utility bills. The reason that it's in a cycle is that one of the leading indicators that we've found empirically to to, to explain how a household is disconnected is that they have been disconnected previously. So once a household enters the cycle of energy insecurity, it becomes very difficult to get out. Now, survey work gives us some information about energy insecurity, but there's a lot of actual information that we think is missing and is very needed. And so I set out with the team to, con uh, to construct a utility disconnection dashboard. And this dashboard is now live, and it features all data from all utilities that actually gather information on utility disconnections. And you can track disconnections by place, by state, uh, by utility, and by year. And what we find is that for only 332 reporting utilities, which had reports from last year, that there are almost 3 million utility disconnections in the past year. So a very high number. Now, which factors correlate with energy insecurity? What we find is that certain households are far more likely to be disconnected than others. In particular, households with inefficient housing conditions. They might have holes in the walls, for example, broken HVAC systems or, or broken refrigerators. Second, we find that when somebody resides in the house who relies on electricity 
for an electronic medical device for their lives, they are far more likely to be disconnected from their service provider. And finally, we find that certain social demographic characteristics matter significantly. First, the lowest income households are the most likely to be energy insecure. Second, households with young children under the age of five are far more likely by a factor of three to be disconnected than our households without young children. And households of color are significantly more likely to be disconnected than our white households by a factor of three for black households and by a factor of four for Hispanic households. Now, as part of our work, we've also looked at coping strategies. That is, how do households cope when they're facing these very extreme conditions, when they can't turn their heat or their air conditioning on? What do they do, is the question that, that we've asked through survey work. And what we find is, um, I would say, threefold here. And, and let me point out that this is a, a representative sample of low-income households, those within 200% of the federal poverty line. We find that over half of all low-income households use at least one form of a coping strategy. And we find that the majority of them use several all at once. And we find that the most commonly used coping strategies are also the most dangerous. So here you can see that 27% of all low-income households across the United States accrue debt on a regular basis because they can't pay their energy bills. About a quarter also use some kind of risky temperature behavior. And by this I mean you might flare your stove, for example, to, to warm your space. You might open your oven to warm your space. You might put a... Um, uh, you might burn trash within your home, for example, to warm your bodies. Uh, about 17% forego expenses on things like food or medical care. Now, those are all the dark bars. The least common are the light bars, and these are the things that are also the least risky, including seeking out government assistance, such as through the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Only 11% of households are calling the utility and asking for help, or calling a friend and asking for help. Now, one of the things that I'm really interested in in my work is preventative solutions to energy insecurity. Recall in the first slide that I told you that energy insecurity for most households is a cycle, right? Once you enter that cycle, it is very difficult to get out. And so here I'm giving you the linear version of this same idea. And uh, down here, I'm giving you some policy prescriptions. So in my work, I focus on all of these different policies in different projects and different papers, um, including thinking about debt relief, thinking about better disconnection protections, particularly particularly as climate change makes our climate much worse, and these protections don't protect at the times when people need them, when there's extreme weather, uh, such as cyclones, thinking about bill assistance. And then here I'm going to focus specifically on the box on the left, and these are what I call the preventative solutions. These are things that can help a household ever enter into the state of energy and security. And so here I have two ongoing projects. The first is looking at residential solar and whether low-income households having access to residential solar actually decreases their incidence of energy insecurity. Does it lead them to be able to pay their energy bills more often? Does it lead them to avoid utility disconnections? And the second project is one that we just kicked off. It's uh, right off the ground. It's in the city of Cincinnati. It's a randomized control experiment within the city where we're installing weatherization and electrification in low-income multifamily housing units. And we are, we are looking both pre and post to these treatments as to how the lived experience within these households change and as to how the incidence of energy insecurity may or may not change as a result of weatherization and electrification. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Sarah. And uh, um, uh, first of all, I want to just uh, uh, hold up uh, the memory of Howard. I'm very happy you mentioned Howard Kunruther. Uh, Howard and Paul Kleindorfer were founders of uh, the cl climate research at Wharton, and we miss them a lot. And in, in particular, um, sorry, Howard wasn't here for Professor Burkhauer's presentation on insurance, because uh, one of his big uh, ideas was insurance. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about ESG and why it ain't necessarily good for the climate, which you might think. Why is someone at Wharton saying such a thing? I've had a friendly conversation with Veet Hennish, I see back there, uh, going uh, about uh, what is ESG all about and what are the benefits for the climate and what might, what might be uh, some of the uh, problems for the climate. Um, so if you listen to champions of main, what I'll call mainstream ESG, mainstream ESG, which is based on financial materiality, says this is going to be great for the climate because we're going to see all of the ways in which we can find millions of dollars to invest in the new business ideas that are going to make climate 
uh, may, may, uh, solve the climate problem. So this is all gonna be good. And on first glance, it looks like that makes sense. Uh, so if you think about it, E, S, and G are all relevant to the climate problem. The climate emergency is obviously an environmental issue. Uh, it has a social dimension, as we've already been hearing here on a number of levels. It has to do with inequalities of wealth from north and south and otherwise. Uh, so it uh, has to do with the just transition with respect to uh, the energy problem. And uh, its solution requires good governance to occur in the corporations of the world and the firms of the world. So we need transformation in that sense. So that makes sense. Doesn't it make sense that that's going to be all good for the climate? And my answer is, it ain't necessarily so. Now, I may debut my, I don't usually sing, but it ain't necessarily so. It ain't necessarily so. These things they purport in each corporate report, they just ain't necessarily so. Okay, I didn't really sing. I, you know, okay, I was too, too afraid. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah sang, so I was gonna try to model her. Anyway, basic point is I don't think it's necessarily so because Climate is only one of a huge number of different, well, there's two main problems. And in the interest of time, I'll just, there are more than two, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna talk about two main problems with main, mainstream ESG. Now, this doesn't mean that we might be able to change our ESG understanding, and that's gonna be the punchline that I'm gonna give you, how we move to beyond ESG. We can call the initiative beyond ESG initiative. But anyway, how we can change it but right now, there's some problems. Big problem number one, there are just too many variables and trade-offs on the dozens of different criteria that all of the voluntary standards right now are using to measure what is ESG. And here's just a list that was presented by a lawyer, Paul Weiss, who came to my MBA classes uh, last quarter, I believe, last quarter in the spring. Uh, and you'll see that there's climate change and GHG emissions appear on this, but it's also with all these other different factors. So how are you actually gonna get traction on what's the largest, arguably, the largest existential crisis that we have right now if you're also expecting business to do all of these other things, some of them very important, like human rights, diversity. There's lots of other uh, very important things that businesses should do. But if you have dozens of issues under environmental, social, and governance, you're just not going to get anything done on uh, any particular issue. At least that's potentially uh, the case. Big problem number two, uncertain purposes. What is ESG for? On the one hand, you could have good intentions. The problem is hell is paved with good intentions. The issue is what are the actual consequences going to be? What are the benefits? We've had ESG for a while. We've had companies saying for a long time they're doing something positive on the climate. Where are we going with respect to greenhouse gases though? We're going in the wrong direction. I have two minutes so I better hurry up. Uh, there's a lot of bullshit. Henry, uh, Harry Frankfurt just died recently, and the definition of bullshit, it's a technically, philosophically acceptable term, is having saying things with no regard with whether they're true or not. And the problem with that is there's a lot of greenwashing. Uh, many, uh, many, many journalists have said this. I wanted to go into a, a lot of it. Is there fraud? Yes. Uh, Goldman Sachs uh, just settled a case with the SEC. Uh, Mellon uh, also just, uh, other, other companies Mellon included just, uh, just file, just uh, settle a case with the SEC. Okay, so the problem is that we have uncertain purposes. We have lots of uh, uh, trade-offs that we don't know about. So what's the solution? I have one minute to tell you the, t the solution very quickly. It's law. The European Union has two new regulations that are going into effect. The Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. Uh, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, you can tell they're very new. The, due, that, the last one I mentioned was just passed in Ju uh, June 2023. Uh, that's one solution. Secondly, just last week, the state of California passed the Climate Related Finance Risk uh, Act, the Climate Corporate Data Accountability Act. I have detailed these on a blog. I don't have time to tell you more about them, but the answer is the European Union, California will have what's called a Brussels effect that I knew Bradford at Columbia Law School talks about. The Brussels effect that was going to affect the way corporations are going to be required to disclose about climate and other issues and a California effect. 
and I'm, you almost held up your zero time, but thanks very much. Thanks, Sarah, um, and thank you guys for being here. Uh, I actually mostly work on machine learning uh, for socially impactful problems, but recently uh, we got pulled into this project that was super fun uh, about trying to understand how uh, new data sets and artificial intelligence, so basically looking at satellite data, remote sensing data, can give us a view into trying to make supply chains more sustainable. And the particular problem we did was uh, in collaboration with a company called Global Fishing Watch, uh, and they're really interested in seafood supply chains. And this is joint work with uh, Joanne at MIT. Uh, so seafood, uh, I'm actually vegetarian, so I had to learn a lot about this. Um, it turns out to be the world's largest employer, like a whopping 260 to 800 million workers. But at the same time, the supply chain is really fraught with uh, environmental and social abuses. So about 20% of global fish catch, and this is a conservative estimate, is caught illegally through IUU shipping. So that has obvious implications for overfishing, marine protected areas, and so on. Uh, and then uh, on the labor side, there's about systemic. There's a lot of systemic forced labor and human trafficking that's actually staffing these ships. Right? These aren't exactly the most desirable jobs. They're not well paid, and it's especially bad in Southeast Asia. So, uh, survey in Thailand of uh, fishermen basically found that 87% of them, which is huge, um, suffered some kind of labor abuse. Right? So, withholding of pay, uh, physical abuse, and other uh, threats, other kind of problems. Um, and a lot of why people think this happens is because as there was a New York Times journalist who actually went on one of these ships to understand the culture. And what's happening is that these ships, you know, they're kind of in the middle of the Pacific Ocean uh, because we're doing high seas fishing because we've overfished everything near the coast. And so for efficiency, these vessels are out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean for like six months, a year, two years, right? So they're very far from civilization. They're very far from recourse for these individuals, very far for law enforcement and so on. And one thing, one practice that's kind of enabling this kind of behavior is something called transshipments, right? So a vessel's in the middle of nowhere, you know, it needs to get supplies, and it needs to get that frozen, you know, caught fish back to land, right? You don't want to eat fish that's two years old, presumably. Uh, and so a smaller supporting vessel will kind of go out, meet with the vessel, you know, transfer, do this exchange of goods and individuals sometimes, then come back to shore, and that way that main vessel can kind of stay out in the middle of the ocean for such a long time, right? Uh, so there's been a lot of interest in kind of trying to understand, you know, should we be allowing these practices? Can we even do anything about it? Uh, because if it's happening in the middle of the Pacific Ocean for a long time, we really just couldn't monitor it, right? We have no visibility into what's going on. So uh, this was actually a tongue-in-cheek uh, comic. It's actually sad, but now I find it funny. Uh, but there's a lot of infographics that you'll find about how to launder illegally caught tuna into the US market. It's super easy. Anybody can do it. You know, you just have to rely on transshipments, right? And these like create a lot of opacity in your supply chain. You, you really have no idea if your fish is coming from a marine protected area. You don't know if it's coming from a place where there are regulations and so on. Right. So, What's really cool now is that we now have ice from space. That's how Global Fishing Watch calls it, and I think it's cute. Um, so they actually analyzed over 32 billion uh, real-time AIS tracking signals. So these are remote sensors that are placed in every vessel that's kind of on the high seas to avoid maritime collisions. Uh, and using, doing that, they basically were able to f identify like 47,000 transshipments. So each red dot on this map is like a transshipment that they think happened. How do they find this? They basically look for two vessels that are like hanging out for 48 hours right next to each other, going at essentially like zero speed. Uh, and you're kind of like, what are they doing? Well, they're probably transshipping, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, you can also look at regions of the ocean where like you're not supposed to transship and where you are allowed to transship because there's weaker regulations and so on. Uh, another really cool data set that I think is really cool, thank you, uh, is the visible infrared imaging radiometer suite. So the ocean goes dark at night unless there's a fishing boat, and then there's a fishing lantern, and then you can see there's a boat there, right? So this is the coast of Southeast Asia. You can actually see, using the light patterns, how much activity is going on. You can see there's a lot more at the coast, but then even as you kind of go out pretty far, like over 200 miles, uh, you can see that there's quite a bit of activity, right? So you can use that to control for various things, like how many people are actually in this area. Okay, so 
Mainly I want to sell the data because I think it's really cool. We like looked at a policy question, but I think there's lots of policy questions that you can look at in this space. Now that you actually have visibility, you can you know, answer all kinds of things. Uh, the question that they came to us with is, do these transshipment spans work, right? Uh, so a lot of buyers are very worried about these um, you know, labor uh, harms and uh, environmental harms. So they were like, if we just ban this from our supply chain, will that do anything, right? A priori, most people are very negative about it uh, because they were like, we can't see them, so like, why would anyone stop it? And would they would it, would it cause more bad behaviors? Like, will vessels like turn off their remote sensing technology? Will they basically just evade areas that have higher regulations and so on? Uh, and you can actually answer these questions because now we can see the transshipments, right? So it did reduce transshipment rates. It didn't lead to any bad additional behaviors as far as we can tell. Uh, and it seems to have had a little bit of an economic impact. So it reduced some fishing activity and increased landing prices a little bit. So there's like a little bit. So now we can try to start understanding what levers uh, buyers and policymakers have to you know, reduce social environmental harm in exchange for you know, slightly more inefficient supply chains. Right? Uh, so I think it's an exciting time. Um, Susanna's uh, satellite data example is actually kind of cooler, but uh, I think there's lots of things that you can do in this space. Thank you. So um, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Arthur. It's good, great to be here again. Uh, last year, I remember it was so uh, it was so fun, and I remember uh, not thinking about this, but like so many people contact me afterward, like to work on things and I had to say no because that's just how it was last year. But this year, I've got people in the lab, so are available in the lab, so if you're interested, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Um, so last year, I prepared five minutes. Of course, it, it, it could have taken 20 or 30 or 40. So this year, I sort of prepared zero. So I, 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 I figured it would take just five, which, which, which is good. Um, so let me find the, uh, the remote, um, which presumably is around here. Uh, oh, there it is, uh, somewhere. Okay, so um, yeah, just just great to be here. Now I should say something about um, you know Howard Kuhnrother as well. I ran the Wharton um, Financial Institution Center for you know twelve or fifteen years, and and with Dick Herring, and um, you know we had occasion to interact with Howard and Paul Kleindorfer, you know, you know, not infrequently. And, you know, his insights in putting things together in various ways were, were invaluable. So, so I miss him too. So let me um, just say then, um, you know, in recent years, um, I work on lots of things. I work on uh, sort of predictive modeling and machine learning kind of in general, but in macroeconomic and financial economic contexts in particular. And of course, that's not at all unrelated to climate. So I have a little sideline um, dealing, dealing with climate. And we've been focusing in recent years mostly on Arctic sea ice. Uh, for various reasons, which I won't go into depth on right now, but but the Arctic is is especially interesting, right? Because the whole planet is warming quickly, but the Arctic is warming two or three times as quickly, and you know so it's kind of a a, a window uh, into the future, and there are all sorts of extra pressing, um, you know costs and benefits of, of warming in the Arctic. One benefit, I'll just say a benefit, the costs are, are overwhelming and, and we all know them, but one benefit is, is transarctic shipping. Um, you know, uh, once transarctic shipping opens up, which will happen in the September because that's the lowest ice month, um, you know, the, the costs of, say, going Rotterdam to Tokyo are gonna be cut in half. In, literally. So from a global, you know, international trade perspective, which is really the, 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 the genesis of all, um, you know, economic benefits, um, this is a big, big deal. So, um, you know, so last year I talked about, like, when is the Arctic going to go ice free? And I'm not going to say anything more about that right now. That was last year. Uh, but that's kind of, like, if you think of that in real time, it's kind of like, like you know, predicting the future and a, and a recursive real time experiment might be like every month I forecast, you know, 12 months out. And I do that again and again and again every month, like a 12 step ahead repeated prediction sorts of, sort of situation. A different situation is I've got a fixed target month. Let's call it September, maybe September of uh, 2024, okay? 
um, because that's in some September, that's when the Arctic's going to be ice free. And that, and it takes about a month to be able to really ship something. So a whole month or, or maybe even two. But, um, you know, that's when things are going to be ice free. So how, how reliably can I predict September of 24 now and next month and the month after and the month after as I approach September of 2024? And of course, once I get there, you know, it's going to be perfect. But, um, you know, what happens along the way and how reliably can I do that? So um, here's um, such an exercise, you know, uh, this happens to be for 2020. But we're working with simple models. If you think of Arctic sea ice as a function of time, kind of a time trend, and sea ice last, you know, think of sea ice in some month, okay, month M, as a function of time and a function of sea ice last month. So there's some dynamic kind of autoregressive effects. And, and sea ice this month so far, right? Because you know, we're thinking about average uh, sea ice, average of daily sea ice over the month. And then, of course, uh, sea ice today, the most recent observation. All of these things should be relevant. What's really re relevant is, is the whole past history, but it's so voluminous and so sort of untidy that you have to organize it in some way. And we've chosen to organize it in this way. So if you look, for example, in 2020 um, at, at the, the distributional forecast, here's in blue what we had in June, and in green what we had in July, and then August, and then September. And of course, September is much more peaked because we've got way more information by the time we get to September, and all the months you know, get more peaked as we go from June to July to August to September. And what you can see here is uh, the same sort of thing dynamically. Here's as we get uh, from days to target going from you know, several months out uh, or several, well, several months out to zero days out. You see how much sharper things get. Here, if we, if we don't go all the way into zero, we just stop at negative 20 because it goes up, it goes crazy, right? Once we get really close to the target, things are, things are, are just you know, very easy. But you can see what happens uh, and, and what the path is at, in this case, at any rate, in 2020. And, if you, and you can look here and see the, the basic um, scenario in terms of forecast uncertainty. Again, as we start 120 days out, lots of uncertainty, and of course, the actual forecast in, in green there moves some, but you see as we, as we go in, it gets closer and closer. Um, and um, so let me just wrap up by saying that um, what I've implicitly showed you here is how we're doing relative to the standard climatological linear trend model, much better, our, our forecast accuracy you know, is much less. You might want to know how we would do against a more sophisticated machine learning model. Our model is so simple that you could take it as the benchmark. It turns out that modern machine learning models don't do any better. Um, and we're working on that now and trying to understand why and how, they, how we might make them do better. So anyway, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. It's, it's great to be here. I'm so happy to see the, the, the interest in this topic. Also happy to see several of my current students here. Uh, I want to share with you some, some, uh, some new research that I'm doing on ESG investing. So investing that takes into account not just climate change, but also other environmental issues, that whole laundry list that Professor Ortz uh, put up. And uh, we're going to try to make some progress here on what we consider a very basic, fundamental question about ESG investing, namely, how much of it is there? Interestingly, despite the huge interest in ESG, we don't have a very good answer to this question of how much ESG investing is there. The typical approach to answering this, this how much question involves summing up the dollars, so the assets under management, of investing institutions that endorse ESG. So when you take that approach, you know, here's some examples of the numbers that you find. The amount of ESG investing ranges from $121 trillion at the high end to $17 trillion on the low end. You're getting some pretty big numbers. I want to zoom in on this first bullet point, the UNPRI approach. So UNPRI stands for the United Nations Principles of Responsible Investing. 
What we've done here is we've, we've summed up the assets of institutions that sign these principles of responsible investing, and we've expressed that sum as a fraction of the size of the overall investment industry. When you do that, you find numbers that are big and getting bigger. So by the end of our sample period, it suggests that 80% of the assets in the investment industry are ESG assets. By that metric, there's a ton of ESG. There's a problem, though. There's a problem with this approach. It has limitations. Um, the first is that it, it gives a number. Let's see if I can get rid of this thing. Uh, well, the first problem is it, it, it can give you a number that's too high. The reason is that not all PRI signatories' investments are ESG related. Right? This relates to the problem of greenwashing. An institution may say they care about ESG, but not actually change their portfolio much in response. But then you've got the opposing problem. It could give you a number that's too low, uh, because there are non-signatories that also have ESG-related investments. An example, there might be a hedge fund out there that doesn't care at all about ESG, but it's tilted toward green stocks simply because it thinks these green stocks are, are underpriced. Or it might be tilting toward green stocks because they're trying to hedge climate-related risks. So we're going to try a different approach. Our approach involves estimating what we call ESG-related portfolio tilts. Here's a super simple example to give you the idea. Imagine there are only two stocks in the world. And we find an, uh, an institution that weights those stocks 70-30. Well, suppose we could figure out this institution would weight them 60-40 if the two stocks had exactly the same ESG profile. So what's happening is it's lo it looks like these stocks' different ESG characteristics are changing the institution weights from 60-40 to 70-30. So in this simple example, we would say this institution's ESG-related portfolio tilt is 10%. Went from 70 to 60, for example. So skipping a lot of details, a lot of hard work, what we've done is we've estimated these ESG portfolio uh, tilts for around 3,000 institutions. These institutions include hedge funds, uh, they include pension funds, endowments. We've even like we've even done this for the portfolio held by the Mormon Church. All right, we do this by getting data on what stocks they actually hold, and on stocks ESG and other characteristics. We then take every institution's tilt and we aggregate it up to the level of the investment industry. And here's what we find. Here's our answer to the question: How much ESG-related investing is there? It's the bottom line. So it's pretty flat over time. By the end of our sample, the number is 6%. That tells us that 6% of the investment industry's assets have an ESG-related tilt. And it's kind of striking, right? It's more than a factor of 10, smaller than what you would get if you took the standard approach of just looking at who signed the UNPRI. So who cares? Like, why should you care about this? Well, the big, big question, the question we wish we could answer is, to what extent can ESG investing help solve the climate crisis? Right? To what extent can ESG investing solve the world's big problems? I wish I could answer that question. We don't. But surely, if you want to answer that big, big question, a first step is to understand, first of all, how much ESG investing is there. And that's what we try to do. So thanks. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Once again, my name is Ji Sung Park. I am an environmental and labor economist. And today, I'd like to share with you uh, some perspectives on a potential determinant of climate risk, which may not be particularly salient, but which may, economic, which may be economically important. OK, so according to a recent survey, the vast majority of CEOs and CFOs report that their firms may not be fully prepared for the adverse financial consequences of climate change. And in particular, you, as you can see, Floods, droughts, and wildfires are listed as the three climate hazards that concern their companies the most. So what I'm going to try to suggest in today's talk is that hotter temperature may deserve a higher place on that list. Indeed, there's growing evidentiary support for this idea that heat may affect economic processes in, in subtle but maybe far more pervasive ways than might first meet the eye. So to give you an example, uh, in an ongoing project where my colleagues and I are using 
many millions of data points from workers' compensation claims in California and elsewhere. And I like how Luke put it, skipping over a lot of hard work and dirty details, um, we find that hotter temperature significantly increases the risk of workplace injury. And again, happy to talk about the details of the methods. But in short, we're using quasi-experimental day-to-day variation in temperature on a work site within a given zip code and month to try to get at the causal effect of temperature on injury risk. And I think it's important to note a few facts. One is that despite the sort of mainstream media coverage and its focus on triple digit killer heat waves, the bulk of the damage actually appears to come from more mundane but more numerous heat events, days with highs in the 80s and 90s, for instance. Right? A second fact that emerges is that while Yes, some of these incidents are due to obviously heat-related and officially reported heat illnesses. Actually, the vast majority appear to come from a wide range of other accidents, things like falling off of a ladder, getting hit by a moving vehicle, getting your hand caught in a machine. And because the base, the, num the total number of these latter kinds of incidents is much larger to begin with, we actually find that they are a much bigger share of the total societal costs. In fact, there's good reason to believe, based on other studies, that these kinds of workplace injuries are not only damaging for workers and their families, but to firms and society at large, right? Given what we know about the effects of workplace injury on medical, medical utilization, healthcare, healthcare utilization, right? On work stoppages, recruitment and retention costs, et cetera. According to our preliminary estimate, in California alone, hotter temperature may be causing upwards of $500 million worth of societal damages due to its effects on workplace uh, accidents and injuries. So these findings are consistent with a rapidly growing literature, which finds, among other things, that hotter temperature, especially in developing economies, can significantly reduce labor productivity and manufacturing output. And moreover, according to some recent studies, that you can actually trace out the ripple effects of heat events in places like India and China through international supply chains to downstream firms, even in rich developed economies like the United States. So just to take a step back, you know, this is a rapidly evolving, exciting research space. My read of the literature is that it's a space in which there are far more questions than answers, which if you think about it, it's, it's kind of a risk and an opportunity, right? The risk, I hope, is somewhat apparent based on what I've just presented. But the opportunity, I think, is that with the right combination of data and social science, we may begin to identify the best practices and policies that might help protect or insulate our organizations and economies from the effects of hotter temperature, right? To dampen the link between heat and economic outcomes. And here, uh, I just want to conclude with this final thought. Um, I would argue that the role of social sciences is vital in this inquiry. And that speaks to the importance of all of you being here. And this is a plug for engaging in work and research in this space. Look, technology is super important. Physical sciences, obviously necessary. But the social sciences here, I would argue, are essential. And the reason for that is sort of captured in the following intuition. It's the idea that. The mapping between any given climate hazard and even physical hazard and realized human suffering or flourishing is most often a complex function of the institutional and economic environment in which that climate hazard manifests, right? Which means to me that there's a lot of urgency in asking such questions as what kinds of climate adaptations are most effective, right? What affects the rate of adoption and diffusion and why? not only for the very salient natural disasters, but also for the less salient uh, climate impacts, such as hotter temperature. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So I would like to talk about uh, trees today. Um, but first, more generally, my uh, research is in environmental and energy economics. And I study topics like renewable energy markets, uh, carbon market design, uh, lots of issues around policies for cars, and then uh, policies that aim to prevent deforestation. So let's, let's get to trees. Uh, and the reason is that forests and biodiversity, more generally, are in a state of crisis. 
um, we know quite a bit about issues around uh, deforestation in, uh, in tropical countries, but there's actually a surprising lack of evidence on the effectiveness of land protection policies in regions like uh, the United States and the European Union. Um, so what I would like to study here is uh, sort of motivated by a development that sounds um, you know, pretty uplifting. There was this um, global um, accord last year. It was uh, the Global Biodiversity Framework where almost 200 countries came together and ratified um, a certain target called the 30 by 30 target in which they pledged to uh, protect 30% of the Earth's waters and land by the year 2030. Um, it's often called the Paris Accord for Nature. So that sounds great, but it leads to the question, how binding or how ambitious is that 30% is that target, really? And what I'm working on with a team of great students and, uh, and Matthias Reiner, my, my uh, collaborator in Toulouse, is we're focusing on the European Union, which is the region that has already protected 26% of its land. Um, their flagship policy is called Natura 2000. It's the largest coordinated land protection policy in the world. And we want to answer the question, how effective has that policy been? Has it actually led to more trees, uh, more vegetation cover? So how do we go about this? Well, we need to collect lots and lots of data. Um, the key outcome here of interest is data on vegetation greenness, which we get from satellites. Um, it's very detailed, so we get uh, a measure of vegetation greenness for each 300 by 300 meter plot in the European Union. It gives us an index between 0 and 100 to indicate how green a particular plot of land is. Um, so we collect this, this big data set on, on, on vegetation, and then we need to know, so where exactly are the protected areas in Europe? There's many of them. We need to know when they first got protected in order to try to figure out, um, did we see that after protection, um, we, there was an increase in, in forest cover or in vegetation greenness more generally? I'll spare you the details, but you need a bunch of fancy econometrics to do this. Um, to summarize, what we really want to do is to compare what happens in these protected areas to areas that are very, very similar in the way that the, the quality of the soil, the, 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 the types of trees, and so on and so forth, but that did not get protected status. Now, that's, uh, that gives us a pretty um, uh, you know, astonishingly large data set with hundreds and hundreds of millions of observations. I've been abusing Wharton's high computing uh, cluster for many years now, lots of emails complaining about uh, you know, sort of my, uh, my fair share of the cluster. But you know, when the computer is, is finally done, you actually get um, an estimate of the effect of how effective Europe's protection has been um, at increasing greenness. And you can see this for different countries and over time, and it gives us lots of valuable information. OK, so let me show you a picture. You're looking at uh, all Europe's protected areas here. Um, you're, the green areas um, are indicating uh, a change in greenness between 1985 and 2020. So this is telling you that protected areas have become a lot greener over time. But Europe as a whole has become a lot greener over time. Right? So you're seeing all areas in Europe. And you see that even outside of protected areas, we've seen uh, increases in greenness of vegetation. So essentially, the question becomes, um, have those protected areas greened any faster than non-protected areas that are similar? So here are the results. And they are a little bit surprising, perhaps. Um, this is the most precise zero I have ever estimated as an applied econometrician, econometrician in, my, in my life. The average effect of land protection on greenness in Europe is 0 0.08 on a scale of 0 to 100. That is absolutely nothing. Um, the graph on the left is showing you, sure, you know, in some countries it's a little positive or a little negative, but sort of in the grand scheme of things, it's very minimal. The graph in the middle is showing you that not only is the effect of Europe's protection policy zero right after protection, you don't expect big trees to grow in a year, but even two decades afterwards, there's no effect. Then we looked into the question, maybe one should expect that land that got protected later in time, so say in the 2000s, has bigger impacts as politicians sort of run out of easy land to protect that you know, wasn't at much risk of economic development, but then they need to start protecting land closer to cities. 
But again, the data doesn't show any evidence for this. So this is maybe um, you know, a bit of a disappointing finding. Um, the question, what it's essentially telling you is that policymakers in Europe have been surgically effective at choosing land to protect that was never really at risk of deforestation. Now, does that mean that protecting land is useless? And I just want to be very clear, the answer is absolutely no. First of all, this land may at some point become under pressure. But it does tell you that Europe could be a lot more ambitious. They could say, you know, set a 40% target, and these data suggest that even reaching that is probably not all that costly from an economical perspective. Um, so we're hoping that the EU will take that sort of call for more ambition to heart. We're planning to engage with the Commission. Um, and uh, with that, I'll thank you for the attention. And I'll mention that even in the social media space, biodiversity, and especially birds, are very endangered these days. Thank you. <laughs>